Christopher, Christopher, I've come back with a warning. What? You were wrong in your last theory video. But I think I found out the theory videos. I just play game. You were wrong. Huh. Hey thinkers, how's it going? Looks like Christopher here has lost all sense of rationality after being asked to think when it was time to game. Thankfully though, with a bunch of coffee, Thinkerfur is here to save the day one tangent at a time. So let's just set that stuff over there aside and go this away. Alrighty, hello thinkers, we've already made introductions so let's get to thinking. So last video we tried to piece together if it was the return of an old Paz Ganondorf from the era of Twilight Princess. However, there is further evidence pointing towards a different alternative. What I pose in this video is the following. What if the body we see resurrected in the teaser of Breath of the Wild isn't a Paz reincarnation of Ganondorf returning, but instead a completely fresh, new, and totally unique Ganondorf specific to the era of Breath of the Wild. Please note that even if this is the case, I still maintain my hypothesis that Breath of the Wild is set within the timeline of the Child Link era following after Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Twilight Princess. There is just far too much evidence pointing towards this being the case. If I'm wrong though, I'll make a video covering why in the future. Here's hoping this doesn't come back to haunt me. <laughs> So, all that aside, let's explore this new Breath of the Wild born and bred Ganondorf. With the recent screening of the Game Awards, we all hoped, if not dreamed, for something newly teased by Nintendo regarding Breath of the Wild 2. But, that turned out to be a whole lot of, well, nothing. So turning our valued attention back to more grounded ideas, let's look back at the cave painting in the teaser. We can clearly see Ganondorf riding atop a horse brandishing a trident. Now I'm going to just speculate, if you will, the meaning of this cave painting and try to interpret what kind of story it is telling. At first glance, one might think its purpose references towards other games, but from my perspective, I believe it may have a different purpose. Perhaps it tells the story of the rise to power, the emergence, if you will, of the great and terrible Ganondorf as he wages war across Hyrule. If we just look at it one more time from the viewpoint of the people who made the cave painting, which most likely is the Zonai, it would obviously have been made because they wish to impart a story towards the viewer looking at it. Assuming that everything about this painting is intentional, think about why he is atop a horse, why he is brandishing his weapon. The meaning can be interpreted many ways, but it genuinely looks like the Zonai are trying to imply in this picture the re-emergence of Ganondorf and his foretold conquest of Hyrule happening once again. This could implicate there being a completely fresh incarnation of Ganondorf, one that incarnated during the time periods of Breath of the Wild. The key point here is re-emergence. Thousands of years have passed and with it the passage of time has granted the people of Hyrule a greater understanding of the issues surrounding them. One such example of this understanding can be seen within the Gerudo tribe themselves. In the cutscene where Link defeats Thunderblade Ganon and attains Urbosa's fury, the following is stated by Urbosa. The bitter essence of defeat from a century ago still sits upon my tongue. But that is now in the past. It was written that Calamity Ganon once adopted the form of a Gerudo. And that will make this victory all the more satisfying. I like that. Now I can take this personally. Once we've established a lock on that thing, it will be up to Link to keep Ganon occupied until the moment we unleash our strike. That moment is going to be so delicious. <laughs> 
From what we can interpret, Urbosa, a chieftain of the Gerudo tribe, deeply resented the fact that Calamity Ganon once adopted the form of a Gerudo and felt there was a deep wrong to be righted. Since the people of the Gerudo tribe accepted her as chief, it would also stand to show that they too share her feelings to such the extent they outlaw all men from town. After cross-checking this with Zeldapedia Wiki, it depicts a strong resentment and a deep sense of responsibility owed to right the wrongs of Ganon. Furthering this, creating a champion states Ganondorf as being the last known king of the Gerudo, and the practice of a Gerudo Vo becoming king ended with Ganondorf, or was the last known male to be born into the tribe, which is a really important point to look at later. Anyway, back on topic, it's clear that the Gerudo have become aware of the fact a male is foretold as born into the Gerudo tribe every 100 years. Furthermore, as inferred by this particular piece of lore, always during during this event of a male born into the Gerudo tribe is the emergence of Ganondorf, and each time he emerges, war, destruction, bloodshed, and to put it bluntly, if not simply, a whole lot of problems are suddenly dropped on the Gerudo. Just look at what happened during the events of Twilight Princess. The Gerudo army was decimated near absolutely by the opposing forces of Hyrule, leaving them absolutely crippled for years. In order to recover and rebuild their numbers and re-establish a decent foothold, they turned back to the deserts. Just look at the location they choose on the map of Breath of the Wild. To a typical Hylian, the deserts are an awful place to survive in. To a Hylian knight in armor, it's also a terrible place to wage war upon, as the sands themselves would greatly hinder mobility. It makes perfect sense that the Gerudo chose this area to rebuild. It's close to their roots and heritage, and it literally acts as a natural buffer to outsiders. All this points towards the Gerudo race being in great need. After losing out in the war, Wars during the Twilight Era, constantly dealing with failure after failure, problem after problem, it makes perfect sense that the Gerudo decided it was time to do something about the menace that was Ganondorf, and in time, they chose to cast him out. Perhaps, it took something controversial for the Gerudo to finally tip even. Now this, thinkers, is where I enter the realms of deep speculation, and I do stress the word speculation. So proceed with caution and an open mind, because I am about to take a real stab at what might have been the entire backstory of Ganondorf leading up to his betrayal in Breath of the Wild. To begin, we must first look at the Sheikah. It is indisputable that the power the Sheikah's technology possessed was immense. The very idea of this technology falling into the wrong hands worried the residents of Hyrule so much that the royal family ordered the Sheikah to bury their technology, and so it was done. This decision, however, caused certain members of the Sheikah to resent the royal family, seeing the royal family's decision as unjustifiable. This extreme difference of view within the tribe members would cause the Sheikah to feel divided and thus cause groups of factions to form, splitting the tribe apart, or more to the point, causing a schism within the tribe. Those that were loyal to Hyrule and the royal family would choose to remain as the Sheikah. Those that were in disagreement, however, would cast down the royal family and pledge their allegiance to Calamity Ganon, forming into their own separate group, the Yiga clan. Now, riddle me this, thinkers. The Yiga hideout is very close to the Gerudo's main area. Why is this? I'll answer that question in just a moment, but firstly consider this. The very first time Calamity Ganon was fought and defeated, we see that there's a huge amount of guardians as well as the four divine beasts surrounding Calamity and attacking it. What if, in this instance, the very first battle with Calamity, Ganondorf had not been captured or sealed? What if Ganondorf had created a truly massive and powerful phantom the Great Calamity, and the Yiga, under advisal of Ganondorf, simply stated they pledged allegiance to Calamity Ganon, but not to Ganondorf himself. In virtually all dialogue I could find referring to the Yiga, there is no mention of Ganondorf, only the Calamity Ganon, but regardless, that would mean that the Yiga were actually serving Ganondorf himself, and not necessarily the entity we know as the Great Calamity. I mean, just think about it. Their base is literally right next to the Gerudo town. This leads me back to my previous question. Why is the Yiga hideout so close to the Gerudo tribe's location? Well, this Ganondorf born within the era set in Breath of the Wild most likely resided within the Gerudo's main area. Having the Yiga base relatively close but well hidden would be ideal. It was close to his main home but remote enough for him to build his forces in secret even from his own people, the Gerudo. To put this into greater perspective, it was the perfect location for the King of Thieves to have a base of operation 
operations in which to plot the downfall of the royal family and other forces of Hyrule without alerting suspicion within his own tribe of what he was doing. Also, on a side note, the location is a very well chosen area from a strategic standpoint. The Yiga clan would not have chosen this area themselves. I mean, they literally can't understand the basic premise of a banana as bait. Let's just weigh it in. It's a remote location with hidden cave networks and passageways, which is very ideal when launching a series of planned attacks with the use of espionage, sabotage, assassinations, and guerrilla tactics. Given how close it is to the Gerudo area, it's just too smart and intentional of a move for the Yiga. Ganondorf himself would have had to have chosen the location. Another interesting point to raise is that the Yiga forces, their entire kit is just, it's just so perfectly in line with Ganondorf's goals. Now, I'll be explaining Ganondorf's goals and how I think he plotted to take over Hyrule in a moment. However, looking closely at the Yiga, they are essentially stealthy magic-powered ninjas with the ability to magically steal and transform into the appearance of others, teleport at any time, any place, even when attacking, and can also perform earth-based elemental attacks, although I'm yet to confirm if they can perform others. The basic foot soldier carries either a vicious sickle or a demon carver. Both are very light, one-handed dagger-like weapons which are great for quick silent assassination moves. They also have the duplex bow which fires multiple arrows at once making for decent range-based ambush attacks. And even if a Yiga was discovered or simply wished to attack an objective or target openly, they have a heavier melee weapon carried by blade masters known as Wind Cleaver, a katana that fires a very powerful air current at targets. Their kit is very niche and fairly duelist centered, but that's fine, especially considering the fact they would be primarily trying to assassinate key figures and destroy or sabotage key resources. Oh, and let's not forget the fact they have the hero of the wild and the champions to deal with. Regardless, if you look past their predilections for bananas, Yiga are incredibly versatile and well optimized for surprise attacks and can quickly retreat or viciously retaliate after discovery if needed, which, as I said, fits Ganondorf's sneaky beaky goals. Speaking of Ganondorf's goals, by now you all can see the assumption I'm making, but regardless, I believe Ganondorf's plan was to insidiously and meticulously cripple and weaken Hyrule's forces in secret, sowing chaos amongst all the inhabitants of Hyrule with one end goal, to weaken Hyrule's forces enough that it would sway the Gerudo tribe into perceiving an opportunity and thus joining once more with Ganondorf for a direct assault on key areas, wiping out Ganondorf's opposition once and for all. Now the question does need to be asked, but why isn't Ganondorf attacking directly with the Gerudo or using their help at all here? Why go to all this effort with a different bowl of bananas? Well, here is the fundamental crux in what would be Ganondorf's plan to take over Hyrule. At this particular point of time, the Gerudo tribe would still feel pain and resentment towards losing the wars of the past and the losses they incurred in the Gerudo Hylian War. Ganondorf would have been to an extent aware of how his people felt as well as observed that they were too war-torn to even conceive the idea of going to war again. He knew he would have to create a secondary force in secret and weaken the forces of Hyrule enough to convince his people it was worth the risk to once more go to war with the royal family of Hyrule. So, with the help of the Yiga, he weakened the forces of Hyrule and forged an opportunity of his own. But, what Ganondorf would not account for in this era of the wild was just how deep the resentment was. On the surface, his people appeared to seem glad they had a strong ruler helping to rebuild. But beneath everything, the Gerudo seethed. They remember the tales of the past Ganondorf. They remember how he failed. They remembered how his selfish conquests led to their downfall and ultimately they dared to resent even Ganondorf himself. Ganondorf, blind to his ambition, most likely never suspected nor perceived their direct resentment towards himself and here's where things would have gone very wrong for his plan. After Ganondorf had weakened and divided the forces of Hyrule with the assistance of monsters and Yiga attacks across the land, the opening Ganondorf wanted to strike directly and seize power finally appeared. Turning towards his people, the Gerudo, to rally them to his cause, he revealed his intentions of war and conquest to an already war-torn and battered tribe. He would speak of an opportunity at hand, a life beyond the sands to his people. But the Gerudo would have none of it. They had accepted the way of the sand and valued peace with other tribes as it had brought trade, commerce, and stability to the Gerudo people. And they were not about to give that up for one man's selfish ambitions. Before the Yiga can intervene, the Gerudo immediately cast down Ganondorf and capture him for daring to bring 
war and ruin once more, which would take Ganondorf by complete and utter surprise. Then, as a final peace offering, the Gerudo hand over the captured Ganondorf to the royal family of Hyrule, where he would be imprisoned for thousands of years until we see him inevitably break free from the seal placed upon him, as we see occurring in the teaser for the sequel. And I'm done. That's it. I'm actually done. There's nothing left on the script, and I'm running out of thinking juice. If you like the theory, hit the like button, comment, let me know what you think below, and if you want to see more videos and get updates, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon. Also, one last thing before I head out to the couch to game. If you want to support the channel further and help fund the channel, I have a merch store and a Patreon where you can support the channel for as little as a dollar a month, and you can even get some cool perks. There's no pressure, but if you do want to help, it goes a long way. I'll be filling the Patreon with lots of behind the scenes content over time as well, so stay tuned. Thanks so much for watching, thinkers. See you all in the next one. Bye! Heroes never die. Ah!